Hello and welcome as I uh, try to record a Ash Wednesday service for us. We are not meeting in person, which you already know, and we are, would have difficulty with COVID-19 precautions doing the imposition of ashes. So we've made the hard decision to do a virtual worship for those who want to participate in that. So let me begin and hopefully I don't mess this up too badly. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Trinity, God Almighty, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer, amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus, amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive them from you. The God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for this Ash Wednesday service comes from the Old Testament prophet Joel in the second chapter, verses 1 and 2, and then 12 through 17. Because of the coming day of the Lord, the prophet Joel calls the people to a community lament. The repentant community declares that God is gracious and asks God to spare the people, lest the nation doubt God's power to save. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their light has never been from old, nor will be again after them in the ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. Rent your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord weep 
Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is your God? Our psalm for today is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and right in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sin with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let me teach your ways to offenders, and sinners shall be restored to you. Rescue me from bloodshed, O God, of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. For you take no delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a troubled and broken heart, O God, you will not despise. The second reading for today comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in the fifth chapter. The ministry of the gospel endures many challenges and hardships. Through this ministry, God's reconciling activity in the death of Christ reaches into the depths of our lives to bring us into a right relationship with God. In this way, God accepts us into the reality of divine salvation. Paul writes, We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. <clears throat> but as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindliness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors, and yet we are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the sixth chapter. 
Glory to you, O Lord. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus commends almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, but emphasizes that spiritual devotion must not be done for show. Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that the alms may be done in secret as your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God, our loving Father, Jesus, our Savior and Lord, and the Holy Spirit, our Comforter and our Teacher. A man took his young son to the Super Bowl this year here in Tampa. And while they were sitting there, the man asked the boy what he was going to give up for Lent. And the boy replied, I don't know, Dad. What are you going to give up? And the father says, well, I have thought about this a lot, and I've decided to give up liquor. Later in the game, the beer vendor came by, and the man ordered a beer. And his son said, hey, hey, I thought you were going to give up liquor. And his father explained, hard liquor, son. I'm giving up hard liquor. This is just a beer. And the boy replied, well then, I guess I will give up hard candy. Last year, Ash Wednesday, was February 26th. Then we abstained from in-person worship after March 8th, and we continued to abstain from in-person worship until November 8th. And those eight months were very long for all of us. And I'm sure that many feel like we had given up church for Lent, and it just kept on going until November. And I know some were saying that the church was closed, although that's not really accurate. Frankly, it pretty well diminishes all of the work that the staff and the volunteers were doing and have been doing throughout this pandemic. While many were staying safer at home, the staff continued working, 
diligently and in creative new ways to provide electronic worship, virtual worship, and to keep the day-to-day -day operations of the congregation active to the best of our ability. Here we are almost a year later, still adhering to pandemic precautions. And it likely still feels like we are giving up church for Lent in 2021. Yet the church has never closed because the church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, people, believers and followers of the way of Jesus. And I'm not trying to be mean. Yet, if you can acknowledge that you know that the church is not a building, and then turn around and tell people that the church is closed, you still don't get it. I'm standing in a building. All alone. There's nobody else in the whole building. Yet, I'm talking to the church. You. Watching this recording from home or wherever you happen to be because the church is open wherever you happen to be. I'm standing in a building all alone by myself because the church is not here. The church is open out there wherever you are. And that's not just something that I say. And that's not just something that our bishop says or the bishop of the National Church says. It's something Jesus says. And he says it here in this gospel. The very first thing Jesus says in today's gospel reading is, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. A definition of piety reads this way. Piety is defined as devotion and reverence to religious practices and God. An example of piety is going to church. There again is that use of the word church to indicate a building which is misleading especially if people begin to think that they have fulfilled their religious obligation to God by appearing in this building on Sunday morning and then church is over for the rest of the week now please don't misunderstand me I'm not saying that coming to worship is wrong. In the same way that Jesus in today's gospel reading is not saying that giving offerings is wrong. And Jesus is not saying that praying is wrong. And Jesus is not saying that fasting is wrong. Jesus is challenging us to examine our hearts, to determine the motivation behind doing these things. And if we do them just to be seen, that is, out of religious obligation, then we have a heart problem. And God sees what is in the heart of everyone. In the Bible, the heart is not the seat of emotions like we think it to be demonstrated by all of those heart-shaped things that we saw this past week leading up to valentine's day on sunday when the bible talks about what is in your heart it is talking about your desires that which motivates your decisions that which motivates your actions. 
Today's psalm that I read, number 51, is credited to King David after lusting for and having an affair with Bathsheba, the wife of a man named Uriah, and ultimately King David ordered Uriah to be sent to the front lines of the war where the fighting was the fiercest. And it was there, just as King David planned, that Uriah would be killed. And now the door has been opened by David's plan for David to take Bathsheba as his own wife because he had already impregnated her. King David's sin kept multiplying. Lust, adultery, deception, abuse of power, and ultimately manslaughter. All because his heart desires were not aligned with God's heart desires. Psalm 51 is about King David crying out to God in confession and repentance and hoping that God will reconcile King David's heart to his own heart. Verse 10 reads, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now there's nothing wrong with desires. The question is, whose desires are we imitating? Jesus' point about being aware of the motivations we have for doing things is our challenge for Lent. To examine our hearts, to see whose desires are we imitating? Are we acting out of our own desires? Are we acting out of other people's desires that we see modeled in this world? Or are we acting out of God's desires? And Jesus' caution is to beware when we give our offerings. We're not to be like the hypocrites who on the outside look like they have a heart for God and God's desires, yet their hearts they actually have the desire to receive the praise of others. And we're to beware when we pray. We're not to be like the hypocrites who on the outside look like they have the heart for God's desires, yet in their own hearts they actually desire others to see how pious they can act. And we're told to beware when we fast. We're not to look like the hypocrites who look dismal and they disfigure their face so that everybody will take pity on them. On the outside, they look like they have a heart for God's desires. Yet in their heart, where their own desires lie, it's the attention of other people that they are seeking to recognize how pitiful they look. King David thought that all of these sins with Bathsheba and Uriah were a secret. Except God knows. God knows what's in a person's heart. And honestly, there's a reasonable chance that other people saw what King David was doing, too. Perhaps they were just afraid to say anything. He is the king, after all. And finally, God had had enough. And God sent the court prophet, Nathan, to call King David out for his sinful ways. What King David thought was a secret... God exposed to the public. Everybody now knew, if they didn't already. Jesus is not telling us to keep our faith a secret. Jesus is not telling us to keep our faith private. There's no such thing as private faith. 
Faith is to be lived out in front, in the public eye, where everyone can see. Jesus does not tell us to beware of practicing our piety before others. Jesus tells us, beware of practicing our piety before others in order to be seen. The caution is against the motivation, the desire that one thinks is secreted away in the heart. The treasures that Jesus talks about at the end of today's gospel reading are not things that people treasure in this world. He's not talking about gold or silver or money or possessions or any of the other objects that people place a high value on in this world. Jesus wants us to discern what does God treasure in God's heart. And for that, let's look back to the prophet Isaiah, or excuse me, Micah, in the sixth chapter at the eighth verse, where he states to us already that we know. God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. No one needs to tell us how to do that. Because we have the perfect example in Jesus' life and ministry to others. We're not called to be like other Christians. We are called to be like Jesus. Instead of asking, what would Jesus do? We can ask, well, what did Jesus do? We already know. We have it. And if you don't know, pick up your Bible and read it. Find out. If we ask, what would Jesus do? Then we might be tempted to make up our own answers based on what we desire in our heart, what we would do, and assign that to Jesus. But when we ask, what did Jesus do? We already have the answer. And we have to decide then whether or not we want to do what Jesus did. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, what do you treasure? Upon what do you place value? What are your heart desires and do your heart desires line up with God's heart desires there are the questions we need to think about during the next 40 days of Lent now may the peace of God which passes all of our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus amen our service continues with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church world and all in need. O oh God, you call your church to be ministers of reconciliation throughout the world. Inspire your church in its proclamation of the gospel and guide its ministries to build up the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
O God, you created the earth and all its inhabitants, and you declared that it is good. Protect mountains and valleys, animals and plants, and direct us to be good stewards of all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you desire peace. Direct our governments and leaders to work for well-being of all people and raise up advocates to speak and serve on behalf of the downtrodden. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you are our hope in the midst of despair, our help in the midst of sorrow, and our consolation in the midst of affliction. Grant comfort to all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and support caregivers who attend to all in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you are love, and you call us to love one another. Accompany with your grace those journeying toward baptism, and call us all to repentance as we prepare to celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you are our life and our salvation. We give you thanks for the righteous who have died in faith. Inspire us by their example to proclaim your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember those of our congregation, O God, who may be suffering physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Please bring healing, peace, and comfort to all those that we name in our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please keep our first responders and military personnel safe, whether they are at home or overseas. Hold them in your loving hands and protect them as they protect us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are what God has made us to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serious.